Dr. Fiona Hill is one of the premier experts on Russian foreign policy. She made headlines after testifying against former President Trump during his second impeachment trial. Lately, she has become extremely critical for how the new German government has addressed the growing crisis at the Ukraine border. Dr. Hill, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Do you think that if President Trump would still be in office, would be at the same crisis level at the Ukraine border as we are right now? I mean, it's hard to say whether, um, you know, the US-Ukraine uh, dynamic would have would have changed with the um, advent of um, a Trump administration. And, you know, partly we'd have to kind of be playing out under what circumstances, because, you know, we also know that here in the United States, if Trump had stayed in power uh, after 2020, it would have been the result of a... Um, uh, basically a coup attempt. So Russia might have seen this as an opportunity to make a move on Ukraine without um, basically expecting any kind of response from the United States or um, uh, Europe, for example, or at least not in tandem. But what is concerning to Putin is the idea that Russia has lost Ukraine, so to speak, on his watch since he has been the president of the Russian Federation. And we've seen many attempts by uh, Putin and the Kremlin to bring Ukraine back into the orbit. And of course, he's responding in large part to the offer that was made by uh, NATO to Ukraine and Georgia in 2008, that they would be at some point members. NATO exercises, joint NATO exercises uh, with uh, Ukraine. Uh, the uh, efforts of President Zelensky to move away uh, from, uh, you know, closer relationship economically uh, as well as politically with uh, Moscow and look uh, more towards the association uh, with Europe and Ukraine's general drift in a European direction. So there could have been easily some other trigger that would have uh, basically uh, got Putin's attention and made him decide to take uh, this occasion is a move against Ukraine. But I just, just if I might un un interrupt yes, you, yes. to we come back to that. I just want to stick for one more que question with Trump. Some say, some Trump supporters obviously, say that with Trump in office, with his, his Trump's anti-NATO course, uh, Putin would have kind of not d done what he did right now. What do you make of that? Well, I think this is about Russia itself. I mean, yes, absolutely. Putin has three demands that he's made about Ukraine, uh, about NATO and no further NATO expansion and about the United States in Europe. Uh, one of the things that uh, President Trump was considering doing beyond NATO was having bilateral security arrangements with other countries. That wouldn't necessarily have involved Ukraine, of course, but Poland. For example, President Trump was talking about removing troops from Germany and putting them in Poland. That would be completely antithetical to anything that Russia would have wanted. That could have been a trigger, for example. And also, President Trump tried to privatise policy toward Ukraine. He tried to force uh, President Zelensky to open up uh, basically investigations into Joe Biden, his son Hunter Biden, uh, basically to uh, investigate them for corruption. And that put Ukraine as part of US domestic politics. Russia wants Ukraine as part of its domestic politics. Putin would have seen the United States as a very weak player internationally uh, in uh, any event under President Trump. He saw a lot of chaos on the domestic front, but a, a President Trump who was focused on China and not a, about Europe. And he may have thought that then, well, nobody's watching Ukraine, nobody cares about Ukraine. And I want to make sure that Ukraine is back in the fold. The United States is weak. You know, there have been um, a great deal of infighting in the United States over Trump staying in power. Europe would have had a rift uh, with um, uh, basically the United States as well. And Putin would have looked at Ukraine. And uh, as he wants to bring Ukraine back into the fold, he's created this idea, this myth, this narrative that Ukraine is intrinsically part of Russia. So I think it's ridiculous to say if Trump was still in power, nothing would have happened because that wouldn't change Russia and Putin's views about Ukraine. Trump is not in power. Uh, uh, Biden, President Biden is in power and he is clearly back also in a leader seat when it comes to NATO. Let's talk a little bit of the response of maybe NATO first and then specifically uh, about Germany. What do you make of, of the way NATO uh, is responding to this current crisis? NATO is responding as it only can, which is to, I mean, basically say that this idea of coercive diplomacy, a you know, strategy of compellence by taking Ukraine hostage and threatening to invade at any moment 
is not going to change NATO's positions uh, or its relationships with Russia. And if, of course, there is a de-escalation of tensions, then there can be some discussions, in fact, about the longer term relationship between NATO and Russia. I mean, basically what Russia is saying is that if NATO uh, doesn't uh, agree and make an ironclad agreement for further expansion, then it's going to destroy Ukraine. Well, that would set an enormous precedent, not just for NATO and for European security, but globally, that basically any other country that has a preponderance of military power and has designs on its neighbor could do exactly the same thing. Do you think uh, NATO will ever commit on not uh, having one or another country as a new member? Question one. And do you think Ukraine will ever become a NATO member? I think that what NATO can do, which is what the European Union has done, right, which is put a moratorium on accession. Um, I mean, what has the European Union done um, recently? It's basically said that it's not going to expand for X period of time uh, because of the difficulties that it's in facing internally. I mean, dealing with Brexit, but, you know, dealing with challenges internally among the members that are already there. That's NATO could do that. But doing it under an atmosphere of compellence of you know, coercive action is very difficult. So Putin's actually making it more difficult for NATO to do this rather than less. Now, in terms of Ukraine and uh, will Ukraine ever be a member of NATO, what happened in 2008 in Bucharest was probably a, a major strategic blunder because for the very first time, NATO actually said two countries, Georgia and Ukraine, will eventually become members of NATO. You, NATO's never done that before. There was always a process for a membership action plan and application, and it didn't mean that that would be actually accepted. So in a way, you know, NATO itself moved away from the uh, processes and procedures that it already had. Now, you know, that might, might want to be tackled. We have also previously had other arrangements where countries have partnerships. Sweden and Finland are not part of NATO, but they have close partnerships and they also have a prospect of joining NATO. Now, Ukraine has attempted uh, to actually have a close partnership with NATO and Russia said that is impossible. So basically what Russia is seeking is the neutralization of Ukraine and perhaps even the demilitarization of Ukraine by the pressure that it's posing. So whatever discussion we have about this has to be done in the right kind of context. I think it's even dangerous to talk about that in this context of compellence, because what Russia is doing is any moment as we're speaking is threatening to invade on the premise that it wants to have this ironclad guarantee. That has to be worked out in the proper framework. We have to address ourselves whether a mistake was made in 2008. Uh, and many people do think that that was a strategic blunder uh, under, you know, kind of uh, different sets of circumstances. And Russia has made it crystal clear that it intends to take military action, as it did against Georgia in 2008, to preclude the membership of Ukraine in NATO. Uh, let's talk about Germany. You were pretty critical about uh, the new government uh, especially when it comes to the way they are talking or not talking about Nord Stream 2. But I understand why they're not doing that, uh, just to be very clear. Um, I mean, what I've been critical about, as many others have been, um, is in a, in a very long time frame. The United States has been opposed to pipelines from the Soviet Union and then from Russia to Europe since the late 1960s and 1970s when they were first initiated. Why? because of where we are now, that those could be used as political leverage, not just that it would be the, the basis for mutually beneficial economic interdependence, but that there was a real high risk, a real risk of the Soviet Union, then Russia trying to use them also as part of compelling or compellence diplomacy. Uh, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Mm. Nord Stream 1, It was the same thing. I was in the um, US administration um, at the time I was the national intelligence officer, you know, under George W. Bush, when the government pushed back against uh, Nord Stream 1 as well with the same warnings. And we didn't succeed in making that point made. So now, you know, what's happening is Germany's compounding the problem. So, you know, this administration, the new administration, I understand, is trying to have more of a strategic ambiguity because it's also a risk to basically impose sanctions or um, uh, basically take action uh, as a deterrent because then the message gets muddled. You know, so there's a lot of pressure from the US Congress right now to already impose sanctions. Well, the Russians believe that the United States will impose sanctions no matter what. And so then the deterrent effect is also lost. 
the punitive effect of after the fact is pretty significant. And I'm, I'm sure that this is what the German government is currently trying to do is to hold that out, you know, as a, as a kind of a prospect if um, uh, the Russians invade. The problem, of course, is trying to show, and this is where the other critical element comes in, that we're unified in our response. How do yeah. you kind of think the new chancellor, Olaf Scholz, did here in Washington um, during uh, or after his meeting or during the press conference with, with President Biden? I think that he actually managed that fairly well in this context, because this is kind of that diplomatic dance. You know, you're on a tightrope and you're trying not to go one way or another. I mean, of course, there is risk for the German government of lawsuits and all kinds of you know, breaches of contract that may um, unfold from all of this. You've got to be very careful on the domestic front. You know, under their previous administration, all the pressure that was put on the German government obviously was counterproductive. I mean, you know, we saw that. Uh, uh, President Biden has tried to address that by, you know, making this Germany's uh, decision. You know, but obviously we need to show complete unity. And I think that um, somehow Chancellor Schultz managed to thread that very difficult needle. Mm -hmm. In public, of course, He didn't really say anything, but he also did not contradict President Biden. When President Biden said, well, we're going to do this right and looked at him, Chancellor Schultz didn't didn't say anything. And behind the scenes, he seems to have made it much more clear to members of Congress and the Senate and other key interlocutors here that Germany is considering this very seriously. And presumably he will pass on that message to President Putin in person when he goes uh, to Moscow, unless, of course, We have some invasion of Ukraine beforehand, which might make that trip um, difficult, maybe put that off. I mean, because I mean, right now we're in a period of great uncertainty. So talking about invasion, Fiona, how would like an invasion look like in, in, in the year 2022? I mean, it's not like 500 tanks kind of across the border or thousands of soldiers marching in. Well, Russia's already invaded Russia, uh, Ukraine. Um, we saw uh, Russian forces about insignia and a covert operation taking Crimea. So there's a 21st version of invasion. And there are, you know, variants of that we could see with also we saw in Donbass use of proxy forces. Um, I think, you know, what Russia would hope if, if they're going to invade, you know, Ukraine um, now uh, and, and make an invasion into parts of territories that they haven't moved into, they might also hope for, you know, some kind of local Uh, response and support, you know, so there may be a playing with, uh, you know, local proxies, you know, trying to see if they can drum up some support among, you know, Russian speakers or those who might be sympathetic towards Russia. Where should the red line be for? for... Well, they've already crossed a red line. So I think we have to kind of reframe this. They can make further inversions, further incursions into, into Ukraine, but they've already done it. So I think we're also falling into a trap here, which is what the Russians want us to do, of, you know, somehow putting Crimea already in Russia. So I think, you know, the more that they move on, this could be something that they will have gained as a result of this. The de facto recognition that Crimea is theirs, that these exercises in, in waters off Crimea and what was Ukrainian waters um, are somehow acceptable and part of these exercises. What will happen the next days and weeks? Maybe you can give us kind of a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. Well, the best and the worst case scenario in some respects are one and the same. It's not just the invasion. It's that this, you know, the invasion doesn't happen, but we keep in this tension on a more permanent basis. And that the whole idea uh, of security, predictability, you know, Europe whole free and peace is gone. I mean, basically, Putin is saying the last 30 years where, you know, we prospered uh, on our terms uh, are unacceptable to Russia. And so that whole idea of Russia integrating into Europe in some fashion, uh, having closer economic, uh, social and political ties with Europe is out the window. And that now we're facing uh, an overtly hostile Russia that has also now joined in with China. Because what we have seen in the recent agreement with uh, President Xi and Putin in Beijing is that Chinese telling the Russians at the very least, we've got your back. We don't like NATO or NATO enlargement either. We certainly don't like the United States not really specifically about Europe as a major market, because for China, that's still important. But the China and Russia are now very much tied together, including the Asia Pacific. And Russia was able to move forces, redeploy forces for the exercise purposes from the Far East to Ukraine. So instead of Russia having to hedge, you know, over the longer term against you know, some prospects of, you know, perhaps a future difficult relationship with China, it can focus all of its attentions on the Western flank. Germany's going to have to now factor Russia in 
to its relationships with China, which is something that you didn't have to do before. And I think this has really changed the entire calculus of European you know, economic uh, as well as uh, security relationships. And also, you know, what Russia is doing is challenging the right of the United States to be intertwined uh, with European uh, security you know, through the transatlantic relationship. I mean, it hasn't said anything particular about Canada, but it's basically challenged that whole idea of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, transatlantic uh, relationships, and basically saying, what right does the United States have to be here? What does Ukraine matter to everyone? Given the warnings from the White House, how imminent is an invasion? I think we have to be vigilant at all times now. I mean, the reason that the United States was saying that it was imminent was to make it very clear that this could happen at any time because of the nature and the scale of the Russian exercises. And that remember, again, that Russia invaded Georgia at the tail end of exercises. It was true that some of the um, equipment and men were returning to base, but there were still sufficient forces amassed in the North Caucasus military district that when there was the pretext, the trigger uh, for conflict, when Mikhail Saakashvili very foolishly took the, um, the bait of you know, exchange of fire from um, Skin Valley in South Ossetia, the Russians moved straight in, right, just, you know, immediately, because they've been practicing for those kinds of contingencies. And that's the danger that we have now that there is a pretext. The pretext would even come from our buildup and our response, you know, our mobilization of effort uh, and, you know, our attempts to uh, do a full court negotiation. You know, the Russians may say, look, you know, they're being aggressive, they're arming Ukraine to the teeth. They're putting forces, like we said, in Poland and uh, the Baltic states. They're convincing themselves. We also have to make sure that we don't give that credence anywhere else on the global stage, including in China. I mean, we have to, Germany has a role that you can push back on China as well. That, you know, basically, you know, why is China complaining about NATO? I mean, Germany's a NATO member. What's this got to do with China? You know, this is a significant market. I mean, does China realize that this is going to destabilize Europe? You know, at a time when China has been trying to, you know, build its relationships up here as well. We can't really allow uh, the Russians to frame this like this because it puts the whole of European security at risk. I mean, the territorial integrity of every European country becomes at risk because historically, none of us are within traditional borders. We, again, we have linguistic groups on all kinds of sides. And these are very sensitive issues in Europe and these will all be inflamed. And this is you know, really my, my great concern here that by this threat of permanent invasion uh, could be hanging over us. Um, you know, we'll obviously respond when Russia does something, but the very threat of this, I think Putin's hoping that we'll start fighting among ourselves because, you know, kind of we'll want to uh, basically push this off. We'll want to kind of keep on pushing this off. And he's waiting to see what we will bring to him uh, to, um, you know, dissuade him, which is the scenario, of course, before World War II in the 1930s. And again, we know our history. He knows our history as well, and he's trying to push all of our historical buttons. Hmm. Very last question, Fiona. What should uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz focus on during his talks with President Putin? Well, I think that making very clear um, the risks for all of this, including the risks to Russia, I mean, the rupture of relationships, very important relationships uh, with Europe. Europe is still Russia's largest trading partner. China hasn't, you know, kind of basically stepped up into that space. Uh, it's, not, it's the people to people ties as well. I mean, there are three million Russian speakers living in Germany, but you also have Belarusians and Ukrainians. Uh, I mean, in Berlin, I mean, it's an international city. Uh, there are so many, you know, we've heard these reports about Putin's yacht, you know, wanting to get repaired in a German port and then leaving. And, you know, we know of uh, not just Russian oligarchs, but Russian regular business people, um, you know, um, citizens, students all the way across Europe. I mean, all of this would be jeopardized by that kind of action because we wouldn't not be able to respond. So all those historic ties and the bonds that we've built up and you know, tried all the movement we've tried to make in terms of the direction of, of Russia and proving those relationships would be um, you know, completely ended by this kind of action. I think we have to be able to try to explain to Russia why Ukraine matters, not because of it's Ukraine per se, but of that importance of an independent sovereign nation state that has been recognized as such for the past 30 years. This will put on you know, jeopardy the um, the integrity of pretty much every European state, you know, triggering off conflict elsewhere. And that, you know, basically what Putin is doing is opening a Pandora's box that he may not be able to control. And I think making that point 
but also still emphasizing about the importance of that German-Russian relationship and the future prospect of doing something differently would be important. I fear, however, that um, Putin's not in the mood to hear about compromise at this point. And we might have to be having those discussions on a continuous basis because he wants to see how we react when the prospect of invasion is, it is, is its most acute when we know that they've got everything in place, they could do various different things and they want to see how we're going to react and whether we'll still stick together. So it also has to be a message of solidarity on the part of NATO, European Union, bilateral, Germany and the United States, so we're all on the same page. Fiona, thank you um, very much. And uh, let's keep this conversation going. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. Thank you.